Hello and welcome. You're watching Arts TV Weekly News Review with me, Pete Nash. Each week we bring you the major news items from across Ethiopia and the region. Earlier this week saw the inauguration of the Mesco Square redevelopment project in Ethiopia's capital. The redevelopment includes a three and a half kilometre pedestrian walkway that stretches from the square all the way to the municipality building on Churchill Road. The redevelopment project, which cost 2.5 billion burr, or roughly $58 million, was designed to allow public rallies, concerts, religious holidays and official events to be held in a safe and comfortable manner. It also includes a massive parking facility which can accommodate nearly 1,500 vehicles in two underground floors. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, who cut the inauguration ribbon, said Mesco Square is a historically significant location and a meeting point for people from every corner of the country. In the past, the square has hosted ceremonies for international leaders, funeral processions, holiday celebrations and anti-government demonstrations, and even provided space for famous Ethiopian athletes to hone their skills. He concluded by saying, development and renewal are not as easy as destruction and demolition. He called upon all competing political parties to cooperate in taking Ethiopia back to former greatness. This week, diaspora philanthropist Hiwat Tadese donated 1 million burr to the Ethiopian Children's Heart Foundation. The money was raised through social media campaigns, raising awareness of the need to improve the treatment for childhood heart disease in Ethiopia. Volunteer ambassador for the Ethiopian Foundation, artist Meseret Mabratu, said using social media for such positive purposes was a welcome contrast to the vengeful and wicked purposes sometimes seen. General manager of the foundation, Haruya Aliendris, said there are several thousand children who are lined up waiting for their chance to get treatment in a medical centre. She also said the centre is only able to provide cardio treatment to sick infants for three days a week due to lack of capacity and resources. The manager called upon public and those who can to extend their support to the children waiting for treatment to get help. This week, Dash and Bank organised a public mountain run under the theme Taking Ethiopia to Greater Heights to commemorate the bank's 25th anniversary. The festival that took place at the Simeon National Parks was held in collaboration with Arts TV and IA Sports Club. Deputy CEO of Dash and Bank said during the event his bank had been supporting people of the area that bears its name in education and sports for many years. He said the bank allocates up to 15 million burr annually for the festival as part of the corporate social responsibility. Mr Caleb Getane, general manager of RAA Sports Club, said his organisation has been involved in a mountain run for the past few years. As well as raising money, it promotes tourism in the Simeon Mountains National Park. Arts Television, as the media partner for the event, is proud to endorse the Simeon Mountain Sports Festival, said the CEO of Arts TV, Mrs. Azewurku. In future, the event will include a greater range of sports activities, as well as music and cultural events. Following recent discussions between Ethiopian Embassy in London and a UK auction house, an agreement was reached to withdraw several Ethiopian artefacts which were due to go under the hammer later this week. The items include an antique leather clad Bible, an Ethiopian cross and a set of graduated horn beakers, all from the estate of a former British Major General who served in a 19th century expedition to Abyssinia, which culminated in the Battle of Magdala. In the aftermath of the 1868 battle, British soldiers engaged in indiscriminate looting of both the Magdala fortress and the surrounding areas. The embassy made a formal request to Busby auctioneers to withdraw the items and negotiations are now underway for the artefacts to be repatriated to Ethiopia. Deputy Head of Mission, Mr. Biene Gebri Meskel said, We are pleased to have reached an agreement with Busby auctioneers. These items are of immense cultural, spiritual and historical value to Ethiopians. It is our belief, he goes on to say, that all Magdala objects must find their way home to bring closure to this painful chapter in our shared history. And now to some regional news. A recent statement by the World Health Organization expressed Tanzania's intentions to soon join the COVAX program, which aims to provide poorer countries with the COVID-19 vaccine. It is the latest sign that Tanzania has dramatically changed its COVID-19 stance. 
following the death of the coronavirus skeptic president, John Magafuli. A WHO official said vaccines could arrive in a country within two weeks. Since taking office in March, new president Samia Suluhu Hassan has sought to gradually bring Tanzania into line with global public standards tackling COVID-19. In another indication of the country's new approach, its finance minister last week said they had approached the International Monetary Fund for a $571 million loan to help tackle economic challenges posed by the pandemic. A condition of the loan requires Tanzania to start collecting and publishing data on COVID-19 infections. A report published recently in Conservation Africa Journal explains how Sudan's Kush dynasty pyramids risk being buried by shifting sand dunes. Beginning around 2500 BC, Sudan's ancient Nubian civilization left behind more than 200 pyramids that rise out of the desert 220 kilometers north of the capital Khartoum. Built of sandstone and granite, the steeply sloping pyramids contain chapels and burial chambers carved with hieroglyphics celebrating the lives of Sudan's ancient rulers. Despite being smaller than the more famous Egyptian pyramids, the Nubian pyramids are as equally magnificent and culturally valuable. Visitors are rewarded with a crowd-free experience and a chance to explore what was once the city of Mero, the wealthy seat of power of the Kush kingdom. However, as the report explains, shifting sand dunes pose an increasing threat to this UNESCO World Heritage Site. Climate change, which has made the land more arid and sandstorms more frequent, is exacerbating the damage caused by the sands as it erodes the intricate pyramid carvings. To combat these unwanted developments, one ambitious African-led environmental project is leading the way. The so-called Great Green Wall is a multi-billion dollar movement bringing together 20 African nations to stop the spread of the Sahara Desert. It aims to restore 100 million hectares of land across the continent from Senegal in the west to Djibouti in the east. The intention is to cultivate the largest living barrier of trees and plants on the planet, with Sudan having the longest stretch of the Wall of Trees. Miners in Botswana have uncovered what is thought to be the third largest white diamond ever found. The 1,098 carat diamond was unearthed in June 1st by Debswana, a joint venture between Botswana government and the precious stone multinational De Beers. This follows the discovery of a 998 carat diamond in northeastern Botswana last November. The recently unearthed diamond is said to be about the same size as a golf ball. The worth is difficult to calculate, but some think it might be worth in a region of 180 to 200 million US dollars. Botswana is the leading diamond producer in Africa, with seven well-established mines, including Dwaneng, the world's richest in terms of value, and Arapa, the world's largest by area. Debswana Managing Director Lynette Armstrong said, this rare and extraordinary stone means so much in the context of diamonds in Botswana. It brings hope to the nation that is currently struggling. And finally, Kenneth Kaunda, Zambia's first president and one of the last African leaders who fought colonialism, has died aged 97. Kaunda was admitted to a military hospital in the capital, Lusaka, on Monday, suffering from pneumonia. His aide said he did not have COVID-19. In the 1950s, Kaunda was a central figure in the country's independence movement, seeking liberation from British rule. He became president following independence in 1964. Kaunda, popularly known as KK, was a strong supporter of efforts to end apartheid in South Africa and won accolades for bowing out peacefully after losing a 1991 general election. He was also a leading supporter of liberation movements in Mozambique and what is now Zimbabwe. In later life, Kaunda turned his attention to the fight against HIV after one of his sons died from an AIDS-related illness. Current Zambian president Edgar Lungu said the country was mourning a true African icon. The government has declared three weeks of national mourning with all forms of entertainment suspended. That brings us to the end of another weekly news review on Arts TV. I've been Pete Nash. Thanks for watching. Catch you next time.